Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Falling Walls Lab Sendai 2020. My name is Yi Jin Chen, a coordinator at Tohoku Forum for Creativity, Tohoku University. We are happy to share an exciting moment and new insights with all of you. Before we start today's contest, I would like to invite the executive vice president of Tohoku University and also the director of Tohoku Forum for Creativity, Professor Motoko Kotani, to give us opening remark. Professor Kotani, please. Uh, so thank you for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for joining the Foreign World Lab Center. I am Moto Kotani, Executive Vice President of Tokyo University and the Director of Tohoku Forum for Creativity. On behalf of the Tohoku Forum for Creativity, I am pleased to say a few words to the participant and the audience. As probably you know, the Foreign World Level gives junior researchers the opportunity to present in three minutes their creative approach to important issue in our society. The Foreign World Lab Sendai has been learning since 2014 as the first level of its kind in Asia. Without a doubt, the Foreign World Lab uh, has encouraged many junior researchers to develop their own original idea. So we are very happy to sponsor this kind of event in Sendai. Uh, due to COVID-19, the Foreign World Lab Center is held online this year, unfortunately. However, as in previous years, we are still able to invite 21 outstanding participants with imaginative approaches to difficult problems. I am very much looking forward to hearing the presentation from all the participants. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kotani. Next, let me introduce today's jury. It's our great honor to invite an interdisciplinary field of jury. So the chair of the today's jury committee is Professor Motoko Kotani. Her is expertise is mathematics. Next, Professor Takanori Atachi from Graduate School of Management, Tokyo Metropolitan University. His expertise is mathematical finance. So Professor Adachi, could you please give us some words? Thank you very much uh, for introducing me. And congratulations to all participants selected as speakers in this difficult year. My name is Takanori Adachi. It is my very honor to be here, uh, the Falling Wars Lab, Sendai, as a jury. Mm. <clears throat> I have been a stock trader at Morgan Stanley uh, in New York for several years, where I developed a trading robot, making the uh, profit for me, actually. And now I am teaching algorithmic trading and uh, probability theory in a business school at the business school, Tokyo Metropolitan University. My students are, uh, like many of you, uh, adult students and have good motivations for making our society better. So I am expected uh, you are the same motivate, you have the same motivations. Uh, I am delighted to hear your great ideas today in this direction. So please enjoy and overcome the COVID-19 storm by your ideas and speech. Thank you, Professor Adachi. Next, Professor John Eve Kabayev from Elite Max. His expertise is material science engineering. So please, Professor Kabayev. Professor Kabayev, can you give yes. some words? Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. And first of all, I'd like to thank a lot Tokyo University for inviting me. Uh, I'm now in France, uh, but I spent two years and a half in uh, Japan, 
as uh, the former director of Elite Max, which is a joint laboratory between Lyon, Université de Lyon, and Tohoku University. My expertise is um, polymer physics, uh, glass transition, nanocomposites based on polymers. And uh, since about 25 years, we have a strong collaboration with Tohoku University. And I am involved in this collaboration since 2000. We have, since that time, a strong relationship with Takagi Sensei in particular. And we developed a joint laboratory in 2009. And then in 2016, we opened a true labs in the mask building, so very close to uh, the building where we are, where you are now. And uh, I'm very pleased to participate to this session. And I, I'm always very uh, interested by the imagination of our candidates. So I'm waiting for hear them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Capaye. So next is Ms. Judith Erika Mekia from ULEX Japan. Her specialty is international relations. So please, Ms. Mekia, can you give us some words? Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone, participants and the jury in the Falling Walls Lab. I'm Yurita Rikamador, the uh, country representative for Eurexa Japan. Uh, my background is in academia. I worked as a professor for more than a decade. Um, I taught Japanese history and uh, was involved in international relations. I, I also have a, a degree in law. So uh, with this diverse background, I do appreciate candidates who actually try to uh, go for a more multidisciplinary approach in their research. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the presentations and working with fellow jury members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. McGear. So next is Mr. Shigenori Oyama, Special Advisor to the Chairman of the Board of Director, Tolkien Corporation. He is a specialist in global technology business management. Mr. Oyama, please. Uh, yes, I'm Shigenori Oyama, a Special Advisor to the Board of the Directors of Tolkien Corporation and Kemet Corporation. Tolkien is a Japanese company in Sendai and Kemet is a US company. Both are electronics device and material companies. I started my career as an electronic engineer to develop the materials and also devices for many IT applications. And I have been the top management of both companies in Japan and the in US for over 10 years. So my uh, specialty is electronic technology and global uh, business management. It is my uh, great pleasure and honor to join this event at jury. Good luck everyone and let's enjoy the event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oyama. Next is Professor Kaori Kuribayashi Shigetomi from Nitobe College, Hokkaido University. Her expertise is origami engineering, biomems. So, Kuribayashi, uh, uh, Professor Kuribayashi Shigetomi, can you please give us some words? Right. Thank you for your introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm Kaori Kuribayashi Shigetomi from Hokkaido University. As you might know, from this year, not only Tohoku people or Tohoku area students are attending this uh, competition. From to, uh, Hokkaido, I'm mean, some of the students, or actually three members from Hokkaido University will join this competition today. And then my expertise is, as uh, Chen Sensei already explained, I do origami engineer. So like, uh, deplorable structure for the space structure. And then also I do uh, combine knowledge to the cell. So I do the regeneration medicine right now. So this remind me when I was a student in Oxford, I was in a degree in a Oxford University in UK. And then we had a 
a lot of competition and then I attended this competition and then I learned a lot. So through this competition, I'm sure you will learn a lot. And then, you know, don't be shy. And then I know most of people already finished your movie, but a question time is also quite important. So show your passion and then enjoy. And then I'm also looking forward to hearing your ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kuribayashi Shigetomi. So the next one is Professor Takashi Suzuki from Graduate School of Medicine, Tohoku University. His expertise is medicine. So Professor Suzuki, could you give, give us some words, please? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It is my great honor to join the Polling Awards Love Sendai in this time as a jury. My name is Takashi Suzuki from Tohoku University. I am a pathologist at the hospital and diagnose various human diseases under microscope. The world of histology under microscope is just like human society and cancer cells really look hateful guys. Can you imagine? My research interest is cancer biology. Everything is possible is my favorite, favorite phrase. Of course, it is essential to make daily efforts for success, but at the same time, keep imagination and passion. So I'm looking forward to hearing great messages from young scientists today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Suzuki. So in today's event, we will have a, a three presentation section and one public lecture session followed by the award ceremony. For each participant, we will play a pre-recorded recorded video of the presentation. Then after the presentation, there's a QA uh, time and the jury will ask the question online. So participants, please don't forget to unmute yourself and get ready to answer. The time for QA is one minute in total. So you will hear bell ring twice during the QA session. The first, the first bell rings at 30 minutes past. The second bell rings at one minute past. So please finish your answer immediately when you hear the second ring. So okay, let us, uh, then we are going to start today's presentation. The first presentation is made by ID number one, Mr. Shinji Noguji from Hokkaido University. His title is Breaking the Wall of Conflict Issues by Developing Materials. Let's welcome Mr. Noguji, please. What do you think of the picture on the left? This is a picture of the conflict in Congo, Africa. Do you know who made the cause of this conflict? Here is a hint. Yes, we made the cause of conflict. Materials containing rare metals, such as tantas, are used in high-tech products like smartphones and computers. The conflict in Congo was due to the crash of government and rebel forces over rare metals. In order to end the conflict, we need to use materials without rare metals. I propose to develop materials without rare metal to end conflict using AI. Many researchers have been trying to develop, develop materials. The problems are, first, it takes a lot of time to synthesize materials. Second, a lot of energy are needed to develop materials. 
to solve this problem, I analyzed the results of the thesis experiment that have performed by text data mining using AI so that we can analyze information, for example, where thesis works and those that don't. Thus, I can avoid trial and error and I can accelerate the speed of development materials. In addition, we can find the synthesis method with low energy, like low temperature synthesis method. I try to end conflict due to rare metals by using my idea efficient material synthesis method with AI. That's all. Thank you. Question, please. Please. May I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, how, do, how more precisely do you plan to use artificial intelligence? Do you are you talking of uh, data mining or what else? Uh, sorry, you mean um, uh, it's used. Uh, it's used by uh, data mining method, right? And so from the literature? Literature? Ah, yes. Uh, data from um, literature right, and uh, paper, research paper. And, and patents and such? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Noguchi. Then I'm going to move to the second presentation. The speaker is ID number three, Dr. Yuta Nagayasu from Tohoku University. The title is Breaking the Wall of Sustainable Lifestyle. Let's welcome Dr. Nagayasu, please. I'd like to talk about breaking the wall of sustainable lifestyle. I'm Yuta Nagayasu from Tohoku University. For achieving SDGs, we have a couple of issues to solve. The first is gap between nature and sustainable technologies. As you know, preserving natural ecosystem is important. However, it's difficult for residents to tackle them independently. On the other hand, sustainable technologies are also important. However, they use toxic sources, barrier metals, and fossil fuel derived sources. With the spread of sustainable technologies, it will have great business opportunities. Uh, linking these environmental improvement efforts uh, lead to solution of environmental issues. The second is gap between workers and brains. Individual lifestyle and consciousness are also important for solving environmental issues. Researchers and politicians ring alarms and make policies to achieve SDGs. However, they rarely do it practically. The citizens do it on site. I believe sustainable lifestyle will be further spreading through the practical activities of researchers and politicians. For those issues I have mentioned, I propose exciting solution that is integration of rural and urban advantages. The first is integration of regional resources and advanced technologies. I and my colleague have developed new battery using Japanese traditional biochar and organic molecules. By providing variable biochar usage, the forest is managed properly and the ecosystem is also maintained. The second is integration of self-sufficient lifestyle and modern occupations. I and my colleague with modern occupation are trying practically to create eco-village with self-sufficient food and energy. This also leads to minimal security, so we call this system basic infrastructure social system. 
by simultaneously addressing technological and social challenges, I believe sustainable lifestyle can be achieved. Question, please. Ah, please. Ah, Professor Atachi, you unmute, uh, please unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Uh, the your uh, batteries, organic uh, battery, is uh, sufficiently sufficient, efficient, efficient enough for for the com competing the, the current or uh, existing battery. Yes. Uh, can you see the? Uh, can you watch uh, this video? Yes. Uh, now I'm developing uh, organic plex capacitor. So this battery is also uh, has a, a sim similar to a uh, lead battery. Uh, we can uh, replace uh, this battery to uh, real battery. It's enough. Thank you. I have a question. Hi, this is a uh, Kauri from Hokkaido University. Yeah. Just like, a, um, can you use in this battery repeatedly or the variable? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I cannot hear the. Sorry, the time is up. Well, it was a good presentation. Okay. Thank you. Then we are going to the next presentation, which is made by ID number four, Miss Mei Wen Wang from Tohoku University. Her title is Breaking the Wall of National History Museum. Miss Wang, please. And the conflicts between countries and the regions often happen because of the difference in understanding history. It is not a secret that the historical issue have long existed between countries uh, in East Asia. National History of Museum has responsibility to assess people to rethink in their understanding of history. Traditional museum records the uh, country's view of history, which comes often comes with political propaganda and the specific goal in mind. We lost the truly voice uh, of what happened uh, to people. So what we should be doing is recording history in terms of people's uh, perspective to record how people experience and learn uh, from a certain historical event. Only then we can start standing from another perspective. The uh, an ex example is Taiwan used to colonize the by Japan, and after the and Taiwan was governed by the Republic of, of China. Therefore, there are two kinds of war experience that are very different in Taiwan. We invite the people uh, in different backgrounds uh, to share their experience and the things the Pacific generation would know to boost understanding and uh, communication in different communities. Based on the story we present, the uh, we present this excavation on the 17th of uh, the end of World War II. We believe the best way to stop conflicts is to reconcile the past. Museum is not only remembering the conflicts, uh, remembering the past, but it also recording the present. At the 15, 17th anniversary of the end of World War II, we should have a new way to reconciliation to trying to understand different opinions. National History Museum is one of the best uh, place to make it happen. Thank you for your attention. Question, please. Yes, yeah, sure, please. Um, so my question is, are you proposing uh, to do a kind of um, a social inclusion session uh, with participants from uh, society or are you going to have uh, select individuals who are going to uh, relate to history in the past? 
Yeah, we will find uh, some some experienced person to share their uh, experience of historical event to boost the understanding. Uh, because in the past we are only hear the voice from country and uh, maybe professional, but I think the history is all about people, all of us. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations, it's a very good project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wang. I'd like to introduce the next speaker, ID number six, uh, uh, Mr. Pen Chen Pang from Tohoku University. The title is Breaking the Wall of Detecting War Thinking. Let's welcome Mr. Pang, please. Hello everyone, my name is Pan Peng Chen. I'm from China and I'm a master student at Tohoku University. My today's topic is breaking the wall of detecting wall thinning. So wall thinning is a common degradation in many kinds of pipe. It was caused by the liquid that flowed inside this pipe and there are particles may hit the pipe wall and make it thinner and if they crack if the wall thinning grows larger, deeper, it will cause serious accidents. So we need technique to detect this wall thinning. And we have requirements like accuracy, and we want the cheap equi equipment and fast detecting speed. So what I'm introducing today is electrical impedance tomography, EIT. EIT, as many one of you may heard about this for the first time, EIT works like a CT scan in a hospital where a doctor puts you in the, into a machine which will scan around you and give you a picture showing what inside structure inside your body. And EIT is the similar thing, but it uses electricity. It gives current and major signals. And from the signals, we cannot read what inside this part. We need algorithm. We need calculation to provide this image. And similarly, we can use this technique for pipe worsening detection. Uh, this theorem is very simple. We attach the electrode to the surface of pipe, and we can generate this kind of signal. And from, the, from a similar algorithm or calculation, we can get an image showing the pipe wall thinning growing inside. So that's all. Thank you very much. Question, please. Uh, yes, I have a question. Okay. Uh, this is interesting technology, but I guess the uh, actual pipe is long and very complicated structures. Uh, yes. Do you think? Do you think it's your idea applicable for? efficiently or practically to work uh, the uh, testing like you know, those like long complicated you know, the pipes? Ah, yes, actually uh, it's a uh, tomography is uh, uh, give you a picture of uh, uh, cross-section but actually you can move uh, you can move the uh, detection machine uh, scan all around the pipe and we can do that by some robot or other machines. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And very shortly, what happened in the curve, curvatures of the of the sure. pipe? Uh, uh, it it also the same. Uh, with the same thing to rotate. Uh, uh, Thank you. Time pipe. is up. So we are going to the next presentation, which is made by ID number seven. Saludia Salaelela from Tohoku University. The title is Breaking the Wall of Interferometric AIRIs. So please. We are living in a dynamic arts with tectonic plates moving away or toward each other and cause many earthquakes occurs on Earth, especially inland earthquakes that cause surface deformation and leads to severe disaster such as landslide or fault cracking. 
That's why we need to measure the surface deformation. And there's a way to measure it in a wide area, up to 50 km squares and centimeters accuracy. And also can observe during the day and night because it's using radar signal named INSAR, Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. INSAR is a satellite that emitting radar signal to Earth and receive the punch back signal. And by comparing two data set of INSAR, we can calculate the surface deformation in the line of sight direction. However, during the round trip, it passed through the atmosphere and slowed down due to water vapor and ray air contained in atmosphere, and it's absolutely affected the INSAR measurement. For example, this is an interprogram on Barbies called Java Island, Indonesia. Since we measure the surface deformation by the numbers of the fringes, we might think this fringe is better on as a deformation signal. In fact, this fringes shows the effect of atmospheric delays. That's why atmospheric delay mitigation is important. Many times has been done to eliminate the atmospheric delays on INSAR, and this picture is the result of the previous attempt. Even though the noises are reduced, it still has atmospheric effects on it. Our project will go further and will be better because we are using new meteorological model called Mesoscale model or MSM. Compared to the previous model, this model can provide 15-hour precipitation prediction within 3-hour simulation window and higher horizontal accuracy up to 5 kilometers. What we do is calculate the total delay in vertical direction obtained from the MSM model using iterative decomposition model algorithm and iteratively separate the stratified and turbulent component to create new atmospheric model and then apply it to its side. What we expected to see in this new model if the earthquake occur is fringes of interferogram that can provide us information about the event on the ground. Imagine people with bad eyesight get new perfect glasses. Those glasses will help the people to see the world clearly. So that's INSAR with this new atmospheric model. Thank you. Question please. Can you explain the, the, uh, again the, the, the what is uh, the uh, better better things uh, compared with the existing uh, searching method? Uh, this one is better because this this one using new model that uh, it's absolutely better than previous model. So uh, we can use uh, this new model to model the atmospheric delays nowadays. Okay, uh, time stop. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Then the final speaker of this session is ID number eight, Sangita Ratanayake from Hokkaido University. The title is Breaking the Wall of Computer A Therapeutic Design. So Ms. Natonayake, please. Diagnostic testing became critical during the COVID-19 pandemic. Your body can develop immunity when you are infected with the disease, here let's say coronavirus, a type of an antigen. This immunity is indicated with the presence of an antibody. Human body can generate about 10 billion antibodies and each is capable of recognizing a specific antigen. How does an antibody recognize an antigen? Antibodies have a distinctive Y shape. On tip of this Y, there are unique sites that can bind with matching sites on antigens and then destroy it. This is what we think antibody-antigen interaction looks like in three dimensions. Molecules from antibody and antigen 
attract like magnets because of their physiochemical properties like hydropathy or electrostatic interactions. When scientists use computational simulation techniques to assess these kind of interactions, they face a major problem the accuracy of the simulation, which is depending on a scoring function that originally made for generic proteins, not specifically for antibody-antigen interactions. Which means these calculations can be misleading. Is it possible to create a unique scoring function for antibody-antigen simulations? This is the question that my dissertation seeks to answer. We evaluated the physiochemical properties of antibody-antigen bonds by mimicking their interactions. We found, unlike generic protein interactions, which are assumed as hydrophobic, some of the antibody-antigen interactions are hydrophilic. This is very important because when we adjusted the property of hydropathy in the existence scoring function, we could improve the overall accuracy of antibody-antigen simulations. But we are not quite there yet. Nevertheless, the fact that we established that antibody-antigen bonds are somewhat different from generic proteins will allow us to explore more and ultimately to improve the accuracy of medical diagnostics and to treat many diseases from small, simple allergy to complex immune deficiencies and cancer. Thank you. Question, please. Uh, Professor Suki, could you unmute yourself? P Professor Suzuki, can you unmute yourself? Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for your great presentation. I think it's a good idea. So how do you create a scoring, scoring function using the computer? Do you use AI or something? Yes, I'm using data mining and machine learning techniques to uh, analyze this data. Okay, thank you. So thank you. After seeing the sixth presentation with a lot of innovative ideas, let's have a short break. We will start at 2.50, so see you soon.
Okay, let's start the session two of the presentation. My name is Yoshiaki Maeda, the vice director of the Tohoku Forum for Creativity. I'm happy to be a moderator of the presentation session two and three. The first presentation of the session two is given by ID number nine, Kampachiro Urasaki from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the World of Unzen Microbial World by Visualization. The presentation, presentation starts. Hello, everyone. Uh, microbes are uh, too small to see. However, they are uh, all around us. Microbes are living in a symbiotic relationship, and they are forming microbial world. Microbial world supports our life in the field of food industry, wastewater treatment, and something like that. Microbes are key players in the 21st century. However, known microbes are only 1%. So now we can not use all of microbes. So first, we must know the basic information about unknown microbes. Uh, the simplest approach to get some uh, that information uh, is visualization. The existing visualization method uses HRP enzyme. However, HRP enzyme is too big to penetrate a cell wall, so pretreatment is needed. However, there is no common method of pretreatment, so the existing method cannot see unknown microbes. To break this wall, we focus on DNA enzyme. DNA enzyme is normally small DNA, so it can easily penetrate cell wall. Uh, after that, small DNA forms 3D structure, and it has the same function as HRP. Our novel visualization method can see unseen microbes without any pretreatment. So potentially, it can reveal unknown metabolic relationship among uh, unknown microbes and microbial ecosystem. Also, it can help to discover unknown uh, new species of microbes. Thank you very much. Okay, question, please. Any other question? Thank you very much for your presentation. Is it, I'm Jury Seven. It's okay. May, may I ask? One it's okay. Question? Yeah. Short question. Yeah, I agree with your great idea. But uh, I'm afraid that. Uh, it will become an expensive equipment. Is it possible to commercialize cheaply? Yeah, uh, yes, it is. Uh, uh, the reagent is very expensive, but, um, but yeah, so DNA enzyme is expensive, but uh, it's not expensive compared with HRP enzyme. So it is very cost effective method. Oh. oh, it's great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The next presentation is given by ID number 10, Nadia Karuti Kasari from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the World of Dental Implant Failure. Presentation, please. Good afternoon, everyone. The World Health Organization has stated that tooth loss is one of major medical problems. Tooth loss might be happen not only in the older people, but also in the young adult because of the cavity, trauma, or gum disease. Titanium dental implant is the best treatment for tooth replacement. 
it has a function like a natural teeth, and also it contributes to your good health. However, this material still has the risk of the failure because of inflammation on supporting tissue around the dental implant. To fight this inflammation, the first immune cell that contact with the implant is called macrophage. Macrophage can eliminate the inflammation, but they can also produce bone destruction cells. It may lead to the bone breakdown and then become implant loss. So, for breaking the wall of dental implant failure, I plan to build a new wall. So, we are developing a nano surface modification of titanium dental implant. With this surface, we can change the characteristic from smooth to become rough with new special treatment. This surface can change our body response to the cell. And also, it's very effective to maintain the bone condition. With this nanosurface, macrophage can sense different surface and then can respond differently. So in this time, they reduce their potential to become bone destruction cell. And it prevents the bone breakdown and keep the dental implant healthy and stable. So this nanosurface modification of titanium dental implant is a good candidate for the clinical use. Thank you. So question, please. Yes. Hey, I have a question. Yep. I have a question. Do you use this nano surface for the titanium or different materials? Uh, for titanium. Titanium. Do you use in a 3D printing or what kind of uh, uh, For the method, I'm sorry, I cannot publish it now because the paper is not published yet. Mm -hmm. But is we change the surface only without without adding a harmful material. I see. Thank you. One more question, please. Hi. Um, yes. Thank you for all the presentations. It's very interesting. Um, so the, the, your treatment is adaptable for the every all ages, or the for some ages it's effective, but for some ages not so effective, or something like that. Oh no, because uh, in here actually nano surface is already reported can increase the osteoblast bone formation cell, but this one is more osteoimmunology. So it we have two way to prevent thank you bone very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. The next presentation is given by ID11, Hideo Otsuka from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the Board of Measuring Seafloor Displacement. Uh, presentation, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Hideo Otsuka from Tohoku University. My title is Breaking the Walls of the Measuring Seafloor Displacement. The earthquakes are produced by the movement of underground faults. When the underground faults moves, the surrounding underground rocks move and displacement appears on the ground. According to investigate this crust of deformation, we can know and understand the mechanisms of the earthquakes. There are some techniques to know displacement on the ground. I think everybody is familiar with GPS to measure the location of yourself. GPS measurement system is using radio waves between the observation on the ground and the satellites. However, it is quite difficult to detect the seafloor crustal deformation because the seafloor is covered with seawater. And the seawater sea obst obstructs the radio waves. Many large earthquakes occurred in the marine region all over the world. Therefore, detecting the seafloor cluster deformation is important for, detecting, for, for understanding the earthquakes in the marine region, and it will contr contribute to the disaster prevention. So my target of this presentation is breaking the wall of the measuring seafloor displacement. The ocean bottom pressure gauge records the water pressure change at the bottom of the, of the sea, and it is one of the instruments that can measure the seafloor displacement. The seafloor displacement changes the amount of the water above the observation. So the vertical seafloor displacement can be recorded as the pressure change. When the pressure increases, it indicates the subsidence 
on the other hand, the de decrease shows the uplift. However, ocean bottom pressure can, be, can also change due to the, the tidal component and the storm and ocean current and so on. So I focus on the horizontal distribution of pressure variation. This variation is different uh, between due to seafloor displacement and water change, uh, weather changes. We, we may separate these two components from OBP records, though it's very difficult. DUNET is one example of OBP network. These OBP data will be used for measuring the seafloor displacement generally in the future. Thank you for my listening. So question, please. May I? Yes, please. Uh, I actually have uh, uh, three questions. Thank you for the informative presentation. Uh, first of all, what's the size of the gauge? What material is it made of? Uh, how big is it? And um, well, actually, your fourth question is, how do you actually get it to the seafloor? Um, and what depth is actually achievable with this device? And uh, the size of the observation, the, the size of the observation is about uh, one, one meter. And uh, we uh, laid these uh, observations on the seafloor about 2,000 or 3,000 uh, meters uh, depth. Right, and what material is it made of? Uh, by the gar gar gars and the uh, plastics. Okay. Yeah, covered by plastics and uh, it's made by gars or the titaniums and so on. Thank you very much. The next presentation is given by ID number 12, uh, Crystal Bernal from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is uh, Breaking the World of Ultra High Speed Forming Process of Nano Micro Materials. Presentation, please. Every second, five tons of steel are transformed into oxide. This can cause contamination of soil, fire, and even explosion. In addition to the environmental cost, the economical cost of corrosion is estimated to be 3.4% of the gross national product. However, 15 to 35% of this amount can be saved due to good management practice that we can resume by prevention, protection, evaluation, repair. A common way to protect against corrosion is the addition of paint on top of the metallic structure. However, paint appears to be quite weak against long-term immersion and impact. To overcome this difficulty, one way is to replace paint with not only anti-corrosive property layer, but also hydrophobic and wear-resistant one, such as ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene or a like material. However, this material appears to be quite difficult to manufacture, especially without lowering their outstanding properties. A way to manufacture them is by cold spray process, which consists in propelling nano to micro-sized particles at very high velocity inside a nozzle in order to impact the substrate and also form a coating. In the past few years, in our lab, we tried to manufacture cold, polymer cold spray solution and even reach 80% of deposition of a super hydrophobic polymer while maintaining its uh, property. However, the, cold, the setup is mainly empirical and this exploit can hardly get exported to other kind of material. To improve the coating capabilities and coating formation, it is necessary to understand the deformation mechanism and the different physics involved in the process, starting from the uh, in-flight behavior of the particle inside the nozzle until its impact on the substrate while accounting for the right constitutive equation for the polymer, and then relate the predicted deformation of the particle to the experimental result in order to break the wall of ultra-high speed forming process of nanomicromaterial. Thank you. Question, please. Okay, I have a question. Yes, please. Since you wanted to coat in quite big tube, and if you use a spray, it takes 
quite a long time. I mean, like long time. And then also whether you can do the uniform coating. Uh, in fact, yes, we succeeded in doing uniform coating of uh, PFA, so the polymer I talked about. Okay. And um, regarding the length of the manufacturing process, it can be quite fast because the travel speed can be uh, very fast, like 20 meters per second. Okay. Any meter per second. So. Right. Okay. So, yes. Thank you. So 10 minutes, 10 seconds. Okay, thank you very much. The next presentation is given by ID number 13, Uni Burubitasari from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the World of Unsustainable uh, Village Businesses. Presentation, please. Have you ever noticed that actually villages have many potentials? There are many villages that have potentials in agriculture, plantation, fisheries, and even tourism. And through village-owned enterprises, or we can simply call it village businesses, the potential of the village can be managed well for the greatest welfare of village community. They can run business units in field of entrepreneurship, tourism, agribusiness, etc. In recent years, there is a significant increasing number of village business in Indonesia. In 2014, there was only around 1,000 village business established, and this number increased to more than 50 times in 2019. However, despite the rapid increase in the number of village businesses, I found surprising facts collected from some sources. This bar chart shows the comparison of established village business and the inactive village business in three provinces in Indonesia. 44% villages already established village business, however, not all of them are active. 21% of them uh, could not sustain their business activity. Thus, unsustainable village business will not bring any benefit for the village community. Instead, they will only spend capital given by the village government. And how to make the unsustainable village business to be more developed and bring benefit for the village? I think many of you are familiar with the term business incubator. According to entrepreneur.com, business incubator is an organization designed to accelerate the growth and success of entrepreneurial companies through an array of business support resources and services that could include physical space, capital, coaching, common services, and networking connection. Business incubation programs are often sponsored by private companies or municipal entities and public institutions. Their goal is to help create and grow young businesses by providing them with necessary support, financial, and technical services. If the unsustainable village businesses can join the business incubation program, I believe that it will be very helpful for them in managing their business. Therefore, I propose to build a village business incubator committee to break the wall of unsustainable village businesses. This is a district level committee and facilitated by the local government. This committee's role is to initiate partnership and collaboration with the business incubator and also to facilitate the unsustainable village businesses to join the incubation programs. Graduating from the business incubation programs, the previously unsustainable village business can run their business well and gain more profits, which will also bring benefits and increase prosperity of village community. Thank you very much. Thank you. So question, please. Professor Shigeto, Tommy, do you have a question? Hi. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. And then, like, business incubator system is quite general. Like, uh, what's the your unique point? Can you explain again? Yes. Thank you for the question. Actually, uh, yes, business incubator is not a new term, but uh, the village business is a public uh, organization. It is belong to the village government, uh, and uh, up to now there are no uh, committee or, or there are no village business that can join the business incubation program. So therefore, we need a, a committee that can facilitate the unsustainable village business to join the business incubation program to motivate them and give them more knowledge and about business management. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Sari. The next presentation is given by ID number 14, Shatabudi Saha from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the World of Demand for Agricultural Land. Presentation, please. Global population is increasing rapidly, especially in developing countries. With increasing global population, the global agricultural food demand is also increasing by 1.3% gradually. However, the arable land per person are decreasing gradually as a result of human settlements and industrial development. If the current situation continues, the world will face severe food shortage in near future. Therefore, there will be a huge demand for agricultural land for, uh, uh, to produce more crops. Therefore, there is no way other than finding alternative lands to produce more crops. Considering this point, I am going to introduce my idea of using ocean as an alternative to agricultural land to produce more crops. But how? To do this, I have come up with the idea of using uh, floating ocean platforms which have just started to be used for renewable energy generation by few countries, such as USA, Germany, and Japan. This platform consists of lightweight floating units, along with uh, wave energy converters, photovoltaic cells, and small wind turbines. Uh, such platforms are 144 meters squared in size, with a uh, loading capacity of 20 tons. Using the same base, is it possible to produce more crops if we do some structural modification in this platform, such as supplying soil or other plant growth supporting material, providing shades to protect crops against seawater, giving space in between two plant beds to allow sunlight penetration. Cultivation of agricultural crops on these uh, floating platforms will enable us to tackle the future food shortage without causing any socioeconomic and uh, environmental problems, including adverse impact on mariculture and uh, offshore renewable energy generations. I believe that my idea uh, will break the wall of demand for agricultural land. Thank you. Okay, question please. Hi. No. Can I can I make a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm Jerry Seven. Thank you very much for your great presentation. I agree with your idea because the ocean is much bigger than the land. So my question is, uh, uh, could you tell me how to supply water to the floating ocean platform? Uh, for supplying water and uh, other uh, facilities like fertilizer or pesticide, uh, we can use the system called integrated cultivation accelerating systems, which consist of a liquid supply tank and uh, 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 crop cultivation tubes. So, uh, and um, there is a no chance of leakage of water and something, and it's already tested that uh, using these systems, um, the yield increase 50 to 60 percent, and the uh, um, while the water uh, supply is reduced uh, uh, 70 to 90 percent. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. The last presentation of session two is given by ID number 15, Jin Takasai from Hokkaido University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the World of mystery of in a dolphin brain. Presentation, please. Hello, everyone. Today, I talk about my research of the dolphin brain. Two years ago, I got this beautiful brain from a dolphin called Harbor Phobos. Compared with human brain and mouse brain, you can see that it's very weird shape. I got interested in this brain and I decided to review the evolutionary characteristic of this brain by an approach of comparative neural anatomy. Please look at these four graphs. These are relationship between neural numbers and brain weight in each brain region from a various kind of species. You can see uh, two lines. 
Red line is from primate with a higher neuronal density than other mammals. And blue one is from other mammals like deer. And I wonder that. How about how about hoppers? Do they have higher neuron density like primates, or they follow the non-primate scaling rule like other mammals? I decided to estimate the total number of neurons of their brain. But all the method like stereological analysis takes so long time for this big brain. I had to find an easier and faster and more precise method for this research. And this is the solution. The method is called isotropic fraction inter technique. This method has only four steps cutting, homogenization, and staining, and counting. Through these four steps, we can get the total number of neurons and cells and the ratio between neurons and cells. And it's easier and faster and more precise method. That's what I wanted. And I could get the data of Hubble focus. And here's the result. Please look at the black star. This is the data of Hubble focus. And you can see that Hubble focus has higher neuronal density than other mammals. This data shows us that dolphins and whales may have got a different scaling rule in the aquatic environment since over 50 million years ago. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The question, please. Sorry, thank you. Yes, the Professor Shigetomi. Thank you for your presentation. It's interesting. But uh, how yes. is research in uh, affecting the society? So, as, it, as you say, uh, this is the fundamental research, but I believe that revealing the neural system of a mammalian brain as a great information device uh, will be useful for the ICP field, for example. Uh, I believe that our basic research can be the base of future biomimetic technologies. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any other question? <laughs> Any other question, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, the session two is now over, and we'll have a short break, and we'll start again at 3.30. Please come back here until 3.30. Thank you very much.
Welcome to the session three. So we will start the final session. The participants are you ready? Okay, the first presentation of the session three is given by ID number 16, Chin Mai from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the Wall of Global Warming and Malaria. Presentation, please. Global warming is an alarming issue over the world, which is likely to increase the risk of malaria because it can promote the number of mosquitoes. Vietnam also has to face the increasing malaria risk, with about 70% of population at risk in 2018. To control malaria, sleeping under an insecticide-treated net is an effective measure. However, this measure is not popular in Vietnam, with only 21% of households owning at least a treated net. This indicates the poor preparation of Vietnamese households for the coming problems due to global warming with the potential to spread malaria. Using provincial-level data, I analyzed the relationship between temperature and malaria in Vietnam and simulated the hotspots of malaria due to temperature rise based on that result, while I, I want to target for the insecticide treated net promotion. In 2015, the mean temperature in Vietnam is predicted to increase by 2 Celsius degree in some models. Using that result for my simulation, I found that the national malaria incident is likely to increase by 48%, and only provinces in the north and the south regions are expected to have an increase in malaria incident. Then, by identifying the determinants affecting the treated net ownership in Vietnam using household survey data, I found that 1% increase in media accessibility can produce more than 5% increase in owning a treated net. So, my idea to boost the number of people using treated nets in Vietnam is to launch an advertising campaign called Get in the Net, which distributes information about the hotspot of malaria and the benefits of insecticide treated net in malaria prevention by using the popular SNS in Vietnam, such as Facebook, Zalo, TikTok, or Instagram. My target is young people because they frequently use SNS in their daily life and are easily influenced by the information shared on this platform. Therefore, this campaign will be able to raise their awareness of malaria risk due to global warming and also the benefits of insecticide treated net in malaria prevention. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. The question, please. Yes, you did it. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's a very important topic. Uh, I would like to ask how this campaign would actually be different from other Vietnamese government campaigns uh, conducted in the past. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, actually, the difference between the campaign and the normal campaign in Vietnam is like, I want to distribute the information on SNS platforms like Facebook or Instagram. Because like in the past, we usually use the TV program or like radio news to distribute information. So I think if we use S and S, then the spread of the information will be larger than the normal method. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next presentation is given by ID number 17, Ibuki Kusumoto from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the Wall of Health Street from Edible Oil Spoilage. A presentation, please. What comes to mind when you look at this picture? They are edible oils, looks delicious, fresh, or some of you may think they are healthy. All of these are probably right at this point. Oils are an essential part of a healthy diet. However, if these oils are oxidized, they start to spoil. Limit oxidation deteriorates the oil quality, including nutritional value, flavor, and taste. 
Also, it can result in different health risks, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and Alzheimer's disease. Therefore, you need to replace your oil before it goes bad, being oxidized. But do you know when you should dispose of oils? Expiration date? It works only under the ideal condition. What if it was stored outside a fridge or under sunlight? You have no idea when these oils go bad. To solve this problem, I make an app to check the spoilage level of oils at home. It is based on oxidation factors such as oil types, storage time, temperature, and light. For the oil type factor, I create a database. To make this, I collect data from companies. The data is about oxidation factors such as oxidation spots in molecules or antioxidants. That way, this database reflects each oil characteristics. To use this app, you can just fill out these blanks. For example, you have canola oil. It's been one month since you bought it. The temperature was around 20 degrees Celsius under sunlight. Finally, push the button, and it will tell you if you can use it for cooking. This app gives you a way to protect your own health yourself. For people in developing countries, where usually refrigerators are not available, this can contribute to improving food safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question, please. Uh, yes, oh. Professor Adachi, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for good presentations. I'm wondering that the, the people who cannot buy a refrigerator can buy a uh, cell phone or something for acce uh, accessing that kind of information. Thank you for your question. Um, I actually heard that in developing countries, people uh, cell phones, even though they don't have refrigerators. Okay. I think it's a very important idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Judith, please. Uh, uh, my basic question is, uh, do you input a mean temperature, like an average? Because in most countries, it tends to fluctuate between day and night, and also, you know, like winter, summer. You say my average temperature. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. The next presentation is given by ID number 18, Shin E. Yang from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the Wall of Abundant Mine Waste Water. Presentation, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Xin Yang from Tohoku University. I'm going to break the wall of abundant mine wastewater. This is a photograph captured at Animas River, the United States, in 2015, after about 1 million gallons of wastewater spilled out of the Gold King Mine, which is an abundant mine. As you can see, it turned the entire river orange-brown, but for sure the problem is not about the color of the river, but how harmful it is. Abundant mine wastewater is always acidic and contains heavy metals such as copper, zinc, iron, and sometimes also arsenate and manganese, which is much more toxic. There are fishes living in the river and people living along the river who have to rely on the water for their daily life. So I believe you can imagine how important and necessary it is to treat the water. Chemical precipitation by calcium hydroxide is the most frequently used method. However, high water content sludge is generated, which requires an enormous amount of energy and high cost to during the management. Moreover, shortage of disposal sites has also become a serious concern in recent years. In Japan, there's only 16 years left until all sites are full fueled. So here I'm going to propose a new approach using layer double hydroxide LDH. LDH is capable of removing both cations and anions because of its electrolytic characteristic and structure. 
So it is very suitable for mine wastewater treatment because most mine wastewater contains both metal cations and metal anions. Then what is more expectable about LDH is that we found out that while all the water quality parameters were cleared for environmental standard, treatment using LDH reduced sludge volume considerably. For 500 milliliters of wa water, the final sludge volume was 70 milliliters when using calcium hydroxide, which is about four times more than that of using LDH, which is only 50 milliliters. So this could cut energy consumption and managing costs to a large degree, therefore revealed the very high potential of LDH to break the wall of abundant mine wastewater. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The question, please. I have a question. It's yes. May I ask? Okay. Uh, just a question about uh, you took you use some clay, if I understand correctly, and is it possible to recycle the clay which is used for the filtering? Uh, yes, actually, uh, that is uh, another merit of this LDH, the clay material. But uh, in water treatment, we haven't tried that. But we are also running uh, research targeting uh, carbon carbon dioxide, some gas in our laboratory, and they are uh, regenerated that it can be used uh, about twice or three times in a cycle. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you for your question. Thank you very Thank much. You. The next, next presentation is given by ID number 19, Atul Sri Bastaba from Tohoku University. The title of the presentation is Breaking the Wall of Energy in Beer Brewing. Pre presentation, please. So I'm Atul from India, and I'm studying at Tohoku University. Today, my topic is Breaking the Wall of energy in beer brewing. So beer is the third most consumed drink on the planet after water and tea. Humans are using yeast since 2000 years to brew beer. A typical brewing system involves a tank in which you put water, sugar and yeast where yeast break down sugar to release alcohol and carbon dioxide gas along with heat. A brewing system requires energy for two things. First for homogeneous mixing of nutrients in water and second, cooling the system as brewing is exothermic and temperature affects the taste of the beer. The energy demand to produce one can of beer is about 130 kilojoules, which is equivalent to kinetic energy of a motorbike moving with 120 kilometers per hour. So the big question is, do we have a new way to tackle the problem of high energy demand in brewery? I wondered what can we do to solve this issue? So my idea is, can we use beer bubbles to produce energy? It turns out, yes, we can. Beer bubbles can lift a rubber block as shown on the left hand side. When I put the rubber block to a brewing fluid, it floats upward by addition with bubbles. The next question I asked is, can we use this observation to produce electricity? The answer again turns out to be yes. If we perform beer brewing inside a Faraday coil, we can get electrical energy. This is the schematic of a brewing inside a Faraday coil. As shown, if you put magnet inside the rubber and it floats upward and a current is induced in the uh, copper coil. And when the bubbles at the top break, the rubber sediments and the current in opposite direction is induced. So this goes on cyclically and it produces enough energy to power the mixing and cooling systems of brewery. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Question, please. Yes, Judith, please. And so my question is, uh, to supply a household of four people, for example, how big of a, a tank, how big of a facility do you need? So to supply, for uh, if, if you consider with around four people? Yeah, with electricity, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So... With with the beer brewing system, so around you will need uh, 
टू फोर गैलन ऑफ फोर गैलन ब्यूटी सिस्टम टू पावर 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 हाउस हाउस होल्ड ऑफ फोर फोर पर्सन Okay, thank you very much. Mm, yes. Mm, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh uh, yes, yeah. uh, Professor. Ah, uh, Oyama. Mm. Other, other cheese. Professor, yeah. other cheese, please. Yeah. Um, just, just a comment. I, I think it's very gr great idea, but it, it's necessary that the consumer is also the aware of the, the you know, uh, prepare. Uh, <laughs> not just the less energy here, but also the you know, uh, less uh, the, the consumer. Less energy for producing. I think that's a problem. Thank um, you very much. <laughs> Just to finish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next presentation is given by ID number twenty, Luciana Tenorio, uh, from University of Tokyo. The title of the presentation is "Breaking the World of Building on Mars." Presentation, please. Hi everyone, my name is Luciana Tenorio and I'm currently a BSc student at the University of Tokyo in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And today I'm going to talk about origami inspired habitat for Mars. These proposals start from a very simple concept, to build a habitat on Mars. But really, how do we do that? Mars is a very hostile environment. It involves many challenges to build and live there. A couple of years ago, my career changed drastically. I have a major in architecture, but also I have been an analog astronaut at research stations in the United States. And there I have tested my previous origami structures, like the one you see in this slide. This is a Mars analog environment, where in the future I would like to return and test this new proposal. So you all know, origami is a potential packing method, and many space projects have used the folding principles of origami. So my proposal starts as a very compact, lightweight structure, which can be inflated to the full dimensions once in space. This is to create a human habitat for future crews on Mars. But because this habitat is so huge, we have to come up with a way of folding it up and then fit it inside a rocket. And once it gets to Mars, it can unfold itself. As an architect and engineer, I consider to have the required skills to build a prototype of this habitat and perform a series of experiments, testing the efficiency of the material and study the deployment of the different folding patterns. But the challenge does not only lies in the mechanical aspect. Because this will be in a real human scale, we can test how human will adapt, living in isolation in this kind of very small spaces in order to consider the aesthetics of the interior design. And this is very interesting because I realize that this is one of the main important concerns that astronauts have when they go to space. And as an architect, I want to find the perfect balance between the design for human comfort and the mechanical functions. That will make possible not only to build on Mars, but to live there. I want to change the way we build today. I want to take everything I've learned about architecture and how to build on Earth to reimagine how to build. On Mars. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.、Uh, let me confirm if Luciana is here. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, since she is not here, so the question QA session is cancelled, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> you might have a lot of questions. <laughs> sorry. So, let me.、Uh, Move to the next、uh, presentation. The next presentation is given by ID number 21, Marco Marinkovic from University of Bel Belgrade. The title of the presentation is Breaking the Wall of Earthquake Proof Monthly 
walls in concrete building. Presentation, please. Dear members of the committee, I'm glad that today I have a chance to present you the solution that we're working on, and it's related to the earthquake proof measuring walls in concrete buildings. I'm assistant professor Dr. Marko Marinkovic from Serbia, University of Belgrade. We are working on the measuring infill partition walls, we are, which are often used in concrete structures because of their good thermal characteristics, because they follow current trends of architectural demand. And they are usually considered as non-structural components. That means that they are not active during the earthquakes. However, major infills are strongly active during the earthquakes due to interaction with the surrounding frame. And oftenly, or almost in every medium to strong earthquake, they got damaged. So a lot of walls, infill walls and also partition walls, got damaged during the earthquakes. And beside that, they can sometimes cause even collapse of the whole structures that you can see on the left down photo. On the right down photo, you can see with the white percentage of the costs related to the non-structure components. And this shows the ambition of this project and many research that has been done uh, in the field of measuring walls and partition walls. And our approach is rather new and innovative because our idea is to create a gap between the wall and the frame and in this gap to insert the recycled rubber material. On the left middle photo, you can see the U shape of the rubber that is connected to the wall and to the frame through this blue rectangular, which is a plastic or wooden profile. We conducted the experimental tests and the first results you can see on the left down corner with the green curve, our system, wall with our system and the red traditional system. You can see that we have reached far more drift, so three times more the displacement. On the right figures, you can see the damage in the up of the traditional system and undamaged uh, wall in our case. So this system uh, serves to prevent the collapse of the walls and prevent breaking of the walls, which is the topic of this competition. I'm glad that you had time to listen to this presentation and wish you all the best. Thank you very much. So the question, please. Do you still have a question? Yes, I, my question is, are you actually using this for um, reinforcing old constructions or basically also um, using it for new constructions? And are you actually using itong, um, you know, the bricks or any other materials where you can also use uh, anything else besides, you know, itong type uh, bricks? Yes, uh, thank you for the question, of course. It is applicable to any type of the brick. Uh, that's the, I think, main benefit of uh, this solution. Uh, because we are just adding it between the wall and the frame or the slab inside the building. And you can add it during the construction of the new building, but you also you can insert it <coughs> in already existing buildings. So just making the cut and then uh, going with the mortar. The yeah, I was going to ask you. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last presentation of session three is given by ID number 22, uh, Jonas Fisher from University of Tokyo. The title of his presentation is Breaking the Wall of Energy Efficient Data Storage. Presentation, please. If you think back 20 or 30 years ago, you probably didn't have a mobile phone. The internet had just started and was only consisting of a few servers around the world. Nowadays, we have smartphones, tablet, laptops, smartwatches, smart speakers, all these IT devices, and all of them use the internet. So of course, the amount of IT servers that we have also increased drastically along with the amount of these devices. And so of course, has the amount of electricity all these devices and all these servers need. One reason is that we store data magnetically. That means inside the hard drive, inside of the computers, are little magnets that either point up or down that are either a zero or a one. And every time you want to change this zero to a one, you want to change the magnet from pointing up to pointing down, you have to apply a magnetic field. 
And this magnetic field requires electricity. Electricity that is largely just wasted by going to heat. In nature, magnetic fields are made by lightning. So you, maybe you can imagine how much electrons are involved, how much electricity is wasted here. A much better way would be if we could control these little magnets with electric fields. Electric fields are incredibly easy to make. Maybe you've seen it before. You can just rub a balloon against your head. And what you can see then when the balloon sticks to your head, that is actually an electric field. So it's really easy to make. It costs almost no electricity. And an estimate says that if we can control the little magnets in our data storage devices with electric fields instead of magnetic fields, we could be 10,000 times more efficient, 10,000 times less energy that we need here. So if we could save our data magnetically by using electric fields instead of magnetic fields, it would be a great benefit. The problem is normal magnets cannot do this. Normal magnets cannot be controlled by an electric field. For this, we need special magnets called multiferroics. And the ones we are looking at, the little magnets inside the material, they actually have a specific form of rotation that allows them to be controlled by an electric field. These materials are quite rare, complicated to understand. So what we are trying to do is control the magnetism with electric fields, understand these materials better, and get them towards an application in our computers and IT devices of the future. And they could even allow completely new kinds of devices. Thank you very much. Question, please. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Adachi. Um, I have a question. Thank you. A very great idea. But I'm wondering, Sassi, because uh, your idea is will be completed with uh, the, uh, not with the H, uh, hard disk drive, but this uh, solid state drive. So how about, you, do, do, how about this thing? Yes. Uh, so for this explanation, I explained hard drives because they're easiest to understand. But multiferroics can be used for various kinds of data storage and even completely new IT devices, like uh, you can combine logic and uh, memory functions. So they, if we can get them to a place where we can use them in computers, they could have great benefits and could be used for very different kinds of devices. So not really just competing with hard drives. Okay, thank you. Do you think it's uh, applicable uh, also the, the quantum, uh, quantum computing? Um, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, it's more, maybe more for regular computers, but yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Now, all presentation have been done. Uh, thank you very much again for your, for your excellent presentation. Now, the jury members will go to the jury meeting for deciding the winners. During the jury meeting, we will have a public lecture. So we will start the public lecture at four, five, five past four. So please wait for a while uh, to prepare the public lectures. Anyway, thank you very much for your cooperation. The presentation is over.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I would like to welcome all of you to the uh, public uh, lecture session of Falling Walls Lab Sendai 2020. Uh, 2020. My name is Toshiyuki Takagi, and I'm uh, vice, uh, vice director of TOF Column for Creativity Talk University. So it is a great pleasure for me to start a public lecture session. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, invited lecture from Chao Wei Chen, Professor Chao Wei Chen of Research Institute of Electrical Communication, Tohoku University. Before the lecture, that I, I would like to introduce Professor Chen first. Uh, Dr. Uh, Cha Wei Chen is a, uh, an associate professor at Tohoku University. In, she is a neuroscientist with a strong interest in, in interpersonal communication. Dr. Chen participated in many scientific community outreach activities. She works with government, NGO, schools, and TV channels to promote brain science. And also, she coaches students for various uh, competitions, such as three-minute thesis and many public speaking contests. In this public lecture, she's going to help our contestant with a brief training on science communication. She's going to make a lecture uh, titled, Breaking the Wall of Science Communication. Please start the lecture, Professor Tem, please. I'm a scientist specializing in brain science. I'm an associate professor at Tohoku University right now. Today is such a great honor to be part of this event. I think all of you must be like me, feel thrilled and excited to hear so many outstanding scientific reports so far. So today, I'm very happy to have the chance to share with you some of my experiences in science communication. I had strong passion about biology when I was a child. The secrets behind all the living creature, plants, or even bacteria fascinated me. But it wasn't until my university that the subject of brain science was introduced to me. Then I fell in love with it. Our brains are the most mysterious and most complicated biological system you can ever possibly find on this planet. So, I stayed, researched, studied, and now I'm a professor in brain science at Tohoku University. Because of my job, now I have many, many opportunities to meet many people and talk about my passion of brain science. Most of my time during the day, I spend it in my research lab. My lab is supported by government and private foundation fundings. So it is very natural and it is my responsibility to tell people why my research is important and also persuade them they have to continue to support us. And I'm going to share with you some of my recent opportunities. Like myself, Brain science is only a subject for study in the university. So many high school students or younger students do not have the chance to know what it is until they enter the university. So I joined this initiative to provide the free public lectures for middle school students. They come to the university for one hour after their regular school to learn about what brain science is. I was very excited after a few years 
to discover that some of those high school students actually entered the university and then chose brain science, neuroscience, or related subject as their major. Because I also study the development of infant brains, we sometimes provide the lectures for parents to tell them how their baby's brain grow in the first year of life. They were very eager to know, and it's a very exciting experience to talk to parents about our research. I also have the experience to work with TV program, help them create six minutes of TV program to introduce brain science. When we talk about six minutes brain science TV program, we actually have five minutes and 20 seconds because the other 40 seconds are for commercial. So it is a very intense and time-limited challenge to squeeze a lot of things inside this limited allowance. It's very similar to the challenges all the contestants in the Falling Wall Lab have today. So I have come to this realization that science communication, it is an interactive, communication format between scientists and then the general uh, groups. So today, I'm going to share with you my personal method that I find helpful and powerful in talking science to non-scientists. And I call it A, B, C method. So I'm going to introduce to you my A, B, C method. We'll start with A. A is audience. Have to know your audience. Know your audience. Are they middle school students? Are they parents? Are they investors? Different audience will have different motivation. And then we tailor made the presentation for the audience. This is like a going to a restaurant. If I want to eat something quick in Japan, I will go to a ramen restaurant because it's fast. But if I want to have a relaxing time with my friend, then I should go to a cafe where I can sit longer. Different kind of purpose will lead to different choices. Different audience will also demand different kind of communication method. For example, in the virtual presentation, for general audience, it is recommended that you have to have enough changes. Every four minutes, you must do some changes. The changes can be the slide change to video, the video change to story, so for people watching an online presentation, four minutes is pretty the limit of attention. This is for general population. However, if your audience is a teenager, the four minutes will shorten to one minute. The reason is the teenager generation are the video game population. They are so used to do the fast paced information flow. They will fall asleep if you wait for four minutes. For teenager population, you need to speed up. So know your audience and then plan the presentation for your audience. But it doesn't matter what kind of audience. They all come with the same thing in their mind. That is W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? Why am I here to listen to you? When we have the stage, when we have the time, we have the responsibility to offer something valuable for the audience. So we have to identify what's their interest. For a falling war event, the judges, the audience, the investors are looking for the new idea, the idea that changing the world. So you need to make sure this message is very clearly presented to this particular audience. So this is the A audience. Now it comes to the B. 
build a message. B stands for build a message. Science is very complicated. My brain science is like this wool ball. It is very colorful. It has a lot of things inside of your brain. There is neuron, and then there are cells, and there are sisters, there are connection. It's very, very complicated. My brain science is complicated. Your chemical sciences is also complicated. Civil engineering, physics, they are all complicated. But it is our responsibility to make it easy to follow. With the same kind of rich information, we can decide what kind of message or what kind of output we want to create. With the same kind of wool, you can make a sweater or sock. So we need to make it very clear what's the message out from this very rich information. Because all of the presenters today already did a very good job to state the problem they observe and then their solution. So I want to challenge you more. Not only build a message, but build a memorable message. So ask yourself, a week after this contest, what do you want people to remember your presentation? Today we have about 20 presenters. Each spends three minutes, so it's a very, very long process. After a week, what do you want the judges or the audience to remember from your presentation? Probably, I will be only single statement. So, to create a memorable message means that you have to emphasize the most important thing that you want people to keep in mind. And this is a big challenge for me as well. Today, I'm going to spend 30, 40 minutes with you. But after a week, what do I want you to remember from these 30 or 40 minutes? It is a challenge for me. So, I have several choices. For example, I can want you to remember about this event, or I can let you remember about my background, and etc. But today, my goal is to make you remember the A, B, C method for science communication. Okay, so I hope in a week, some of you will still remember it. So we have talk about audience, build a message, and then we come to C. C, connect with a story. Many of you are already very successfully communicating science with graph, plot, formula, or models. And these are the tools we scientists use very frequently. And you have done a very good job today to explain your graph, your study, and your result. So I want to challenge you to try something different. I want to challenge you to try to use a story in addition of those usual scientific tools. Why story? Story is good because it's historical, it's cross-cultural, it's universal. And kids like stories, adults like stories, old people also like stories. Storytelling is just a very attractive and very nice tool. Inside a story, there are two components. One is the logic. The story needs to start from somewhere, and then there's the climax, and then you have a solution. It needs to have a logic to follow. And I think this part is easy for scientists, because we are all trained in logic communication. There's another part of the story, that is the emotion. That part we don't talk much, but it is very powerful. Emotion is the part that it doesn't come with graph, but it provokes a very ancient part of your brain so that you are attached to the message. So if you recall 
my presentation so far. There are several stories inside. I started by telling you my childhood dream, and I talked to you about my encounters in various science outreach activities. So although I'm trying to introduce the ABC method, I tell my stories. And then the story also help a speaker to be more likable. Some of you probably saying, hey, I'm only presenting my science study. I'm not here to be liked by other people. It is not the scientist's job to be liked. You are right. But people tend to believe people they like more. So if you want your presentations to be more persuasive, more convincing, it helps you to be a likable speaker. So I'm a brain scientist. I want to show you the brain when people are listening to a story. When people are listening to a story, many of your brain regions are activated. Your language part will be highlighted, but also your reasoning part, but also your empathy, the, the ability that you feel for someone. And then because your brain is such an active mode when you are telling story, people are more engaged. And then this engagement will help them to remember longer. When I was teaching an intro course, I used to go to a class with 300 and 500 students, and I need to teach them about learning theory, what the learning changed our brain. So to make my lecture more memorable, I usually tell them about the story of my cat, how I trained my cat, and then to teach him how to open the door and to get the food and so on. And I combine this cat story with possible brain changes in my lecture. So it's very interesting that a couple years ago, I was on the street in London, and then a young person stopped me and they asked me if I still remember him. It turned out he was one of my students in this 300 and 500 classroom. And honestly, I don't remember him. So he asked me, so how is your cat? I was surprised after so many years. Probably he did not remember much about the learning theory, but he still remembered the story about my cat. So storytelling is a very powerful tool, and for two and a half minute presentation, it may be hard to squeeze in, but I want to encourage you to just think, to start to think about the possibility to use this tool in your future science communication. So to sum up the ABC method, A is know your audience, analyze your audience, Give them what they want to know. B, build a message. Scientists are responsible to make the very rich information easy to digest, a message memorable, and then easy to follow. Finally, C, connect with the story. Try to put something personal in your science communication presentation next time. It'll enhance your presentation, and then make you a more likable speaker. So when we are trying to convey our passion of science with the general public, remember that it's always like a two brain actively exchanging information. And I hope my ABC method today will help you to understand the receiver, the audience, try to build a bridge between the two, try to break in the wall of communication barrier by building a clear message. And finally, to maintain that relation with a story. Thank you for your time. And if there's any question, I would be very happy to answer. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Professor Chen. That a very interesting and a very informative uh, lecture. That uh, uh, we must remember the ABC method. So now we can uh, 
take some questions. So please turn on the video and also please uh, raise your hand if you have questions. Okay. So oh, before I get the first question, uh, I just want to ask uh, Professor Chen uh, as a first uh, question. Professor Chen, that, uh, what is the, your general impression of presenter today? Thank you. I'm very happy I'm not one of the jury today. It is so <laughs> hard to pick the winners. I think today's presentation was very successful. A lot of slides were very informative. They are relevant and artistically designed. So I like the slides. I also like the diversity of the topics, ranging from biology, engineering, and human science. I can also sense the passion from all the presenters. And I really get a lot from today. If I'm going to use the ABC to analyze today's event, I think all the presenters did their best to consider the audience because I did not hear a lot of jargon that required additional uh, explanation. And the message is very clear because every presentation can be summarized by one sentence of breaking wall of blah, blah. And finally, story. I was looking for a story. I heard some people relate that with their home country or their personal history. So I think some of you already master of the ABC method. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any other question or comment? If you want, uh, if you have a question, uh, please turn on the camera and raise your hand. Oh yes, uh, Dr. Wang. May I have a question? Uh, thank you for your excellent uh, presentation. I learned a lot of from it. Uh, but I want to uh, ask a question about uh, we have an online context today. Is there any special attention we should pay to online context? Thank you for the question. It is a very special year. And it is so interesting to have this format, which is very challenging. I think the biggest difference between online and in-person uh, comes from a few limitations. So first is your infrastructure. You have to at least get online so that we can hear you clearly. We can see you. For the online connection quality, there are a few things to pay attention because usually there's a delay. So if we want to move our body part, we should slow down. If you do too quick, it's hard to see in the camera. That's the first. And the second about online is there is no live audience. And we have to learn how to talk and look into the camera, which is a machine, which our gene, our brain is not built to look at. So this requires some training. What I have been doing when I have online meeting or online presentation is put a sticker or print out a picture of my favorite idols above the webcam so that I'm motivated to look at it more. So these are the online presentation and contest like points I will pay more attention with. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Any other question? Okay, then uh, I just want to ask one more question. But, uh, so, so for example, that uh, today that only a uh, very two minutes uh, talk or two. In that case, uh, does it, uh, can it be possible to include some story even in a very short uh, period? That's a very, very good question. You know, usually when we tell stories, it can go on 101 days. So how to put personal story into a short presentation is a challenge. Today, I heard a few good examples. Mm. For example, people start by telling about their childhood encounter with a dolphin, and that motivated their research. So that is a very personal start. And I also heard people talk about research about their hometown, 
the situation in the hometown. So that is a good, good relation. My own research is about brain science. So if I start my presentation from neurons, brain areas, that won't be attractive at all. So what I usually do is I will look for a clinical case, a patient, for example, a patient whose life is affected by this brain disease, and then to change the situation for that particular person. This is why brain research is needed. So we feel more connected with a human or things we know, like relevant to, to us. So even within two and a half minutes, it's a very short time frame. It is possible by starting your whole presentation with some personal note or someone else's story, because human-human connection is always stronger than human and object. Okay. Thank you very much. So any other question? from contestants, no? Okay. In that case, I, I want to continue to uh, ask a question. That, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, some, some speakers are very nervous but, uh, when um, and they make a uh, presentation. But is, is there any way to overcome such a kind of a feeling? So, so we can, if, how do we have uh, some confidence for the uh, presentation? Oh. This is a great question, because most people will prefer to die than speak in public. Public speaking anxiety mm. is universal. So just like building our muscle, I think the best way to overcome our fear or anxiety for public speaking is to do more exercise. Like if you want to be strong, you go to the gym, you go walk, you go running, you go jogging. Public speaking is no difference. If you want to be good and to be comfortable and to be master, you have to keep practicing. So just to stay behind the screen and feel anxious does not really help you. The best way is to confront your fear. Find a safe place. Find a gym for your public speaking, and then exercise. Train yourself. Then your speaking muscle mm. will be built. That, that's my best advice. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Uh, I have a yes. question. Dr. Noguchi? Okay, thank you for presentation. Uh, I have a question. I think there will be more online academic meeting in the future, but what do we think should be taken into consideration when presentation online, uh, especially academic meetings? Usually, my experience is people have a very low standard about academic presentation. People care about the content first. And then the delivery, the method, they care less. They, they are very lenient for scientists. Yeah. But I think that's wrong. I feel everyone, whenever we have so many people's time, we are responsible to make it interesting and make the time worthy. So I think you have started to think about that question. It's a very good start. Uh, from my, my angle, I can see that your setup is very proper because lighting is good. We can see your face. Sometimes I see people sitting in front of a window with light coming from the back, so their face becomes really dark. Your setup is very clear because we can see your face, so this allows you to use facial expression to emphasize your point. Another thing that we are doing different right now is you are sitting down and I'm standing up. If the setup allows you to stand up, I encourage you to stand up because when we go to conferences, we present by standing up in front of people. And when you stand up, you also have more room to do body gesture, and the energy is better when you stand up. So if there's something that I would suggest, it will be try to stand up speaking, watch the, the background setting, but you look very good already. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then uh, Dr. Kasai. So, yes. uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting for me studying uh, the brain of uh, uh, mammals. So my question is about the uh, uh, presentation skill. So 
when we talk about the talk about uh, some basic research, it's a bit harder to, uh, to get the interest from the audience. And you introduced me a uh, lot of techniques. If you have uh, if you have more technique when you talk about more scientific or more uh, difficult topic, could you tell me about it? So you said the dolphin brain, right? I remember. Yes, dolphin brain. Very memorable. So today, if you're going to an academic conference of dolphin experts, probably you don't need much consideration because they are, they are your professional, they are experts. So you can get into the point. The neuron pathway and so on, no problem. But if you, today you are in the falling, fall, falling wall event, we have social scientists, we have yes. a medical doctor, then that's a little bit different uh, audience. So what I usually do is I will find something that these people guarantee to know. And then I will use a metaphor to introduce my science. So what, what do people all know? For example, when I say we need to tailor made for audience, I gave an example of picking the restaurant. If you're talking, you need to go to cafe. If you want fast, you go to ramen. So this kind of metaphor immediately bring people into the situation. Science is no difference. I want to say my method is faster than the old method. Instead of explaining a lot of technology, find something that they can relate to. Mm. Find something that everyone has common experience with, and that may be a good start before you give them something additional. Okay, I hope you. that helps. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay. In that case, that, uh, I want to ask one more thing. That uh, today, that uh, there is a, a, in, a presentation and also a Q and A. Sometimes the Q and A is not so easy. That uh, so, if you have any uh, tips for Q and A, would you kindly let us know? Thank you. This this question is very close to my heart. Because to be very honest with you, like before today I come here, I thought about, oh, should I fake I'm sick? I cannot come because it's a Q&A after my presentation. Q&A is usually very unpredictable. But after so many years, I have built up some method that I want to share with you. And I actually have some slides. Can I have my slides up? So I call how to conquer the Q&A method, like a C. B, A, it's the reverse of A, B, C. So the Q and A actually falls into the category that we call impromptu speech or unprepared speech. It means that you don't know what other people will ask you. And this is not uncommon. For example, you go to job interview. You don't know what question they will give you. You go to conference. After your presentation, there will be a question. You go dating to meet your girlfriend's parents. They are going to grill you with something. So these kind of impromptu sessions are actually quite important and common in life. So I'm going to offer you my CBA method. First, calm down. I, if you're next to me and touch my heart, you will see how fast my heart beats. It is just very, very stressful to be in that kind of situation. And I sometimes even forget to breathe when I'm very nervous. So to control our stress, to make it work for us, there are two methods, two ways. One is to work on the body. The other one is to work on the mind. So for the body, I usually do the breath. This way you're taking the oxygen. It gives you enough energy in the brain to do more. But this works for the body, the breath. If you have a space, you can also do some easy exercise. Just relax the muscle for body. For the mind, sometimes we're so nervous because we feel those people asking questions are monsters. They are finding reasons to eat us. But a very different approach, like closer to reality, is they are actually there to help us. Only people interested in our research well, ask a question. Those people not interested, they are indifferent. 
So instead of seeing people as monsters to eat us, try to reframe it, change the mentality. They are actually there to support us to be better. So if you feel they are supporting you, then probably it's more likely that you're talking to friends. That kind of easy atmosphere will come in. So the first C is calm down. Work with the body and mind. Second, be prepared. Even though it's called unprepared session, it's actually possible to prepare, and you should prepare. I prepared. That's why I have the slides, CBA. So what I usually do before I go on any presentation is I would do rehearsal with friends, with my students, with my colleagues, and then I collect the questions they have. So today, before this, I asked some friends, and then they helped me with a possible question for me to prepare. With the preparation, you feel more confident. When we get a, a question, first analyze. Do I know the answer? Is it about the purpose, the process, or the impact? After we analyze, then we quickly form a message. And then we try to connect the audience with our answer. There are different templates that you can use when you answer a question. And these templates are like many, many in the internet. For example, if people ask you, can you tell me a little bit about research? Then I probably use the 5W. I'll tell them what it is, when I started to do it, how it was done, and why I'm doing it. So the why, how, when, etc. 5W. Sometimes in science, they will ask your opinion, yes or no. In that case, I will tell them my answer with reason of support and then a conclusion. So there are actually different templates that you can use in the Q&A session. But of course, the master, they will combine different methods when they see appropriate. So be prepared. Finally, what if I don't know the answer? This is probably the most scary phenomenon for any speaker. So usually, the speaking occasion, there are two kinds. One is scientific conference. You are speaking in front of a group of experts who usually know more than you do. So it's normal that you don't know. It's OK. Or like a falling wall, you probably the one knowing most in this room. People trust you. But this audience have different kinds of expertise and their personal experience. So when you talk to this kind of audience, it is OK you don't know the answer. But you have to show the intention that you are interested to continue, to connect, to communicate. Because people may not remember your words, but they will remember how you make them feel. And it's very important to keep in mind that have the good impression that you are interested to engage. So this is my CBA method. Come down, prepare, and then be authentic to be yourself. Thank you very much. Okay. So we must remember ABC and also CBA. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the contestant of today, may, some of them may take, uh, may uh, apply the, uh, this Foreign Sword Lab uh, Sendai again next year. But in that case, uh, they need some more uh, improvement. At, uh, are there any way to improve their presentation technique that, uh, for one year? Mm. I like this question very much. And this is a take home I want to offer you at the end of my session. Mm. And uh, can I have my slides back? So what I usually do, uh, the, the science communication in English is not a one day thing. Okay, you need to continue build up. So what I usually do, I'll share with you. First is because I live in Japan. I don't have a lot of native speaker or friends around me. So to help myself to keep in the pace, to be in the standard, I use several ways to help myself. For example, I watch YouTube, I watch news, I watch CNN, I watch BBC. If you like British accent, watch BBC. And I watch TED Talk. 
because they are the experts doing science communication. So by watching that, we are keeping ourselves in the basic level. The basic level is the consumer, because we don't do anything, we just watch, and then they are free on YouTube. And then we can go to mid-level. That is gradually transforming from consumer to producer. Recently, because I work a lot at home in front of the monitor, so I started to listen to podcasts. And podcasts are a lot of science programs. But very interesting is we can also create podcasts. Create podcasts, you can make short science talks, two and a half minutes, three minutes, and record and release it. When you transform from consumer to producer, you have another of practice. And this is also free. But finally, if you want to be a committed science communicator, you cannot just stay in the mid-level. You need to do more. And what I do is I need to find a community, a group of people, local, <coughs> who can help me with my practice. So I want to introduce you the organization that I have joined called Toastmasters. Toastmasters is a global organization that helps people with English or public speaking communication. In Japan, there are many, many local clubs. And in this club, you actually have a lot of practice opportunity to speak, but not only speak, people will give you feedback. And then it's very supportive and safe. So I like it a lot. Today, a lot of contestants are from Sendai and Sapporo. So the good news is there are actually quite a few English-speaking clubs in Sendai. There are three and one in Sapporo. So all the contestants, if you want to continue to polish yourself and excel in this area, please consider to visit one of your local club after the contest. And you're always free as a guest, and then the, the membership is very, very affordable. So finally, I'm just so honored and excited to be here to meet all of you. We have a common ground that is our passion for science and our eagerness to change the world. So I hope my little inputs today is helpful for you so that we can continue together to bring our research to break different kinds of war. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have come to the end of the public lecture session. And so I would like to conclude this session by thanking Professor Chen and all of those who participated in this discussion. So I think that uh, we will start the award ceremony 4.50. Okay. Just, so we have just three minutes break. Okay. Thank you very much. See you very soon.
Good afternoon again. So welcome to the award ceremony of Falling Swords Lab Sendai 2020. This is the most exciting session today. So I am Toshiyuki Takagi from the uh, Toho Forum for Creativity. Okay. Now, three awardees will be announced in this session by Professor Kotani. Uh, she is the Executive Vice President for Research, and also she is the Evaluation Committee Chair of this event. First three, a third place winner will be announced. So, Professor Kotani, please. As you see, the third uh, winner uh, is uh, San Sangita Latonayana, and the uh, title of uh, the presenter's talk was Breaking the Wall of Computer Aided uh, Therapeutic uh, Design. So, congratulations. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Kotani. And congratulations, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lato, uh, Lato Nayake. Then, uh, second place winner will be announced again. Also, Professor Kotani, please. Okay, so we chose uh, uh, Jonas K.H. Fisher uh, as a second winner. And uh, he talks about uh, breaking the wall of energy efficient data storage. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I feel very honored. Thank you. Okay. Con congratulations, Dr. Fisher. Okay, okay then the, uh, finally, first place winner will be announced. Okay. Professor Kotani, please. Okay, so it was very difficult for us to choose uh, only one person as our first winner, but uh, we finally chose uh, Xin Yi Yang, and uh, she talked about uh, breaking the wall of abundant mine wastewater. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you so much for your evaluation. Congratulations, you. Dr. Yang. Okay. okay, then. I would like to ask three winners to say some words uh, briefly. First, the first place winner, Dr. Yang, can you say some words? Uh, of course, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised now. <laughs> so uh, first of all, thank you so much for the jurors for your evaluation of my study and my presentation. I'm very honored to receive this award. And this gives me much more confidence uh, to continue my research in the future. And I also appreciate the support of my laboratory professor and my laboratory members. So uh, there are still a lot of challenges in my research. So to, I have to overcome that in the future. I hope I can contribute to the world. Um, in the real meaning in the future. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much and congratulations. Then I want to ask uh, Dr. Fisher, second uh, place winner, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'm very honored to have received the second place today. Uh, I hope I could uh, bring across some of the challenges of our research and how multiferroics could be very important for computers of the future. And I want to thank all the other speakers today because I also learned a lot. And of course, I want to thank the Jiro for awarding me this honor. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much and also congratulations. Then uh, uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Lato, Lato Nayake. Can you thank talk? you so much. And uh, it's an unbelievable. This is the first time I won a speech contest, actually. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all the judges. And I really appreciate your questions. And uh, also then uh, to my collaborations in Hokkaido University and also the Institute of Biomedical 
research in Switzerland. They are helping me a lot in this research. And also Nidabe College of Hokkaido University, they help me a lot with preparing the presentation and uh, also the video and everything. And uh, I'm really happy. And also for the, I have one message for the rest of the competitors. Don't stop there. This is just a one opportunity for you to brush up your research and uh, try again and try as much as possible like this speech contest. Whether you win or not, you are still a winner to became uh, to join this final event. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and also congratulations. Okay, then uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Kotani to deliver uh, general remarks, general comment to winners and also speakers of this event. Professor Kotani, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the presenters to give a very, very uh, impressive uh, presentation. And so this is uh, for uh, Tokyo University to have a uh, Foreign World Lab Sendai online. And uh, we found uh, there are some advantage and disadvantage uh, to have this kind of a meeting online. Uh, and I, we, we apologize for some kind of inconvenience for the presenter and audience uh, if uh, there are. And uh, for me, this is the first time to attend the foreign level Sendai itself, and I'm really impressed the speaker presenter's uh, uh, speech. Um, it's really um, fashionable and uh, enjoyable. And the, uh, this year, I found that it has a very wide scope and uh, very international. And for that reason, I also enjoy very much uh, all the presentation. And uh, it was very difficult for us to choose only three persons free, uh, from all 21, 22nd, three uh, presenters. They all are very good. It was very difficult. So if we were not selected as uh, three winners, but uh, you should proud of yourself, you did a really a great job. And of course, uh, to the three winners, I really impressed uh, your speech, uh, your motivation, your uh, innovative idea, and the, how you can express yourself uh, to the audience. And so that is, my impression, and I hope uh, you enjoy today's event and uh, learn uh, from other people's uh, presentation, and I uh, hope this will be a good um, experience for your uh, life. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Kotani. Then uh, I want to ask uh, all juries to talk some brief remarks to winners and also speakers today. Uh, first, may I ask uh, Professor Takanori Adachi from Tokyo Metropolitan University to say some words? Thank you very much. Uh, all three winners made great presentations. Congratulations. Um, as Kotani Sensei mentioned, it was actually quite difficult to pick only three persons from the candidates. So in, order, in, in addition to them, I want to mention that uh, the number three, Nakayasu-san, and also number 11, Otsuka-san, were awesome to me. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. Then uh, I want to ask uh, Professor John Yves Cavalier from Edit Max. John please. Yes, thank you very much, Toshiki. Uh, first of all, I'd like to repeat that it's a great honor to participate to this kind of jury. This is my first third time, and uh, I really, really enjoy it. I'd like to say that um, all the candidates were very good because, of course, there is a kind of auto-selection by the candidate themselves. And, uh, of course, as it has been said several times, it's very difficult to determine the three best. And 
even if we do not all agree exactly, we uh, succeeded in converging with the list. But we have all the feeling that some other could have been also in this list. Well, this is uh, the rule. Uh, what I also see is that the, every year, the quality of the talks is improving. And uh, it, that this is really visible. So it means that more and more people take care of the way they explain their, your, their research. And finally, I would say that this is a very tough and very difficult and very demanding exercise to do, but it's very useful. I mean, you will use your extra, new expertise uh, because you will need it as a candidate for a position uh, to find a, a new job or whatever, and also to present your data in a symposium. So this is really important, even if you didn't get the first position. So I'm very pleased. Thank you very much again. Okay, thank you very much. Then uh, I want to ask uh, Ms. Uh, Judy Erika Ma Maguia from Euraxus Japan, please. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to reiterate um, the sentiments of uh, those who spoke before me. Again, congratulations to the winner, and also congratulations to those of you who uh, are not taking a prize home at this point. Every single step in research, every single presentation that you actually make uh, and, and do brings you closer to that goal that you have put um, in front of yourselves. Basically, um, it's only one step, but with many little steps, you can achieve what you actually want in life. And with that, I would like to thank again for all participants, uh, jury colleagues, and congratulate the uh, winners. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> then I want to ask Mr. Shigenori Oyama from Talking Corporation. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, great presentations and a wide variety of the ideas. I guess like uh, there is a challenge for everyone uh, to do our uh, events, you not know, by remote and by a bit of uh, the, uh, bit of presentations. I especially thank you for uh, the organizer teams to make this event you not know, successful. And uh, I wish we could have uh, some more Q and uh, more Q and A Q and A time, and you know, now more interactive communications with the participants. But again, I can know everybody did a great job. And for young researchers, you know, now dear, I'd like to give a words. Uh, well, please think big, be active, and be interactive with each other to better the world. And you know, once again, I'm very impressed you know, by all the presentations. And I wish that like, you, know, you keep going and you know, now making good impact you know, for the world. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Then uh, I want to ask uh, Professor Kaori Kuribayashi Shigetomi from Hokkaido University. Hi, thank you. So first of all, thank you for all attending this uh, wonderful competition. And you did it. And um, uh, I think it's difference between winner and or not is whether the judge can see clear impact to the society or not. Sometimes students, it's difficult to see whether your research is how impact or contribute in the society. So please think when you're doing your experiment or during your study, please think how your research can variable to the society. So please use your expertise and unleash your potential. Good for your future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then finally, I, I want to ask uh, Professor uh, Takashi Suzuki of Tohoku University. Thank you very much for your great presentation today and uh, congratulations to winners. Every performance is very exciting and I enjoyed it very much. Please keep the passion and change the future of the world by your young power. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, 
for your kind and warm words. And uh, I think that the win uh, winners and also speakers will remember those words. Okay. Now we come to almost the end of the Falling World Love Sunday uh, 2020. Before uh, we close the meeting, uh, I want to make some announcement uh, to winners and also speakers of, uh, of this event. So uh, I, wa I want to show a trophy, a trophy uh, for the first, for the first uh, place winner as a good memory of the award. And uh, this will be sent to you, uh, Dr. Yan, uh, with your name, okay? And, and we will send it, to, uh, send it soon. Thank you. Okay. And also for the Dr. Yan, uh, the first winner has the right to participate in the Fordings World Lab Berlin in November mm -hmm. and, and also has the right to uh, have the right of the video recording to be submitted to the, uh, the event in Berlin. And also, I want to show that uh, this is a TFC uh, tumblers. Uh, so this will be given to the uh, second and third winners. Okay, and uh, we will send, of course, the certificates and the memory items to the winners later by mail. And uh, the participants will also uh, receive the certificate, and which will be uh, sent uh, later. And uh, finally, uh, I want to propose to take a commemorative photo together with speakers and juries and uh, uh, invited a lecture on Zoom. So all the speakers, juries, and uh, uh, would you turn on a video? OK. OK. And also, census here. Okay, so please say cheese. Okay, so it's okay. So everything, it's good. Cheese and that. Okay, one more. Uh, maybe numbers. Someone is missing. Okay, now everybody. Okay, once. Oh yes, he appears. Okay, so once more, cheese. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So. Now that uh, this is the end of the Falling World Lab uh, uh, Sunday 2020, I, I really hope that uh, those awardees and speakers will both make use of their experience from the, uh, this event and continue to keep up their effort. And uh, I would like to close uh, this event thanking again all the speakers all the juries and all the participants who stayed to the end of this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.